David. Today we have Ravesh Vidari, a new faculty here at CMU. And he's going to Hello? be telling us about let's take multiple regression. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, so I'm going to tell you about list decodable regression, and this is a joint work with Adam Clivens and Sushrut Karmalkar from UT Austin. Uh, so let me start by telling you an easy problem. All the problems I'm going to talk about are going to be relatively easy, but let me start with an exceedingly easy one. I'm going to give you n linear equations. n will always be the number of equations I give you. They will always be over the reals. And they will always be in d-dimensional uh, Euclidean space, like r to the d. Okay? So I give you n equations, and I want you to solve them. And I'm going to call this problem easy for the sake of this talk in the sense that it has a polynomial time algorithm, and I don't care what polynomial. And I'm going to sweep all the numerical issues under the rug. Okay? So that sets, this, that sets the stage for what's going to come. So let's twist this setting a little bit. Now I'm going to give you equations, but this time they are generated using a random model. So, so, so L are the variables and X is the Yes, L is a, yeah, OK, good. Yeah, <laughs> L will always be the variable, while when I write L star, it's like the true hidden solution. OK. And okay? X is are not variable. They are the coefficients of your, you know, like your, yeah. Good? Sorry, yeah. So I, I just realized that that looks a bit non-standard, but OK, good. <laughs> All right. L is for linear functions. OK, good. So I'm going to give you random uh, linear equations. OK? Uh, and this time, what does random mean? It's like an average case model of the previous problem. There is some unknown distribution d on r to the small d. I generate this coefficient vectors x i s i i d from this distribution d. I compute you know, its value on some L star, and that's how I generate the right-hand sides. Of course, I don't tell you what L star is. And I give you a bunch of these equations. I want you to find out what L star is. Okay? Now, one more piece of assumption that I'll work with throughout this talk. N is a large enough polynomial that you want. Okay? Here, of course, uh, in reasonable situations, linear uh, in D would suffice. But you know, I'm OK if you use polynomial. Good. So you know, can you use some N which is polynomially large in D and figure out L star? Of course, we can. Easy problem, good. And so in particular, OK, I should say that you know, it's easy problem so long as the distribution is full rank. So in particular, if it's a standard Gaussian, it's all good. All right. So now I can tell you the setting I'm going to deal with. This time, I fixed this average case model from before. Um, and, uh, but, but this time, I only generate alpha fraction of the n equations iid from the model from the previous slide. Okay. And I'm going to call these in liars. Is there a quick question? No, I forgot. Yes, sir. Ah, okay, good. So I'm always going to represent a set of in liars. It's a subset of samples by uh, you know uh, let letter i. Okay. So I give you this alpha fraction of the equations generated as in liars. In liars stand for like good equations or things that I actually care about. Now you know sometimes these in liars may have some additive zero mean independent noise, but today is a pleasant day. Let's not add noise. You know, everything will work for this noise additive setting, but let's not you know, worry about that today. Good. So that's how the inliers are generated. The rest of them, the 1 minus alpha fraction of the equations, are in the control of an evil adversary. Okay? So here is what happens. Okay? I generate the alpha fraction of the inliers from my nice average case model, then hand them over to an adversary. They go and look at it and you know, try to make my life as hard as possible, generate these equations you know, to the best of their ability. They're all powerful. There is no restriction on them. And they generate this 1 minus alpha fraction of the equations. I'm going to call them the outliers. Okay? And just for the sake of this talk, I'm going to worry about the setting, somewhat curious looking setting, where alpha is actually less than half, meaning only a minority of the samples are actually in liars. A majority of the samples are outliers. Okay, so you can think of a number like alpha equals 0.25 for the rest of the talk, just to you know, um, uh, you know, ground your intuition. Good. So now you know this goal kind of looks weird. As you can imagine, it's not going to be possible to do this. And you know, I can imagine a very simple adversary who would make my life impossible if I wanted to find L star. You know, the adversary basically populates the 1 minus alpha fraction of the samples they have in their control with just you know, chunks of alpha n samples. 
each of which looks like an inlier distribution. Everything is the same except the L star is changed to you know, some L1, L2, so on. And so you know, they can somehow make the sample look like one or alpha different clusters of inliers. I clearly cannot distinguish between them. So it's going to be impossible for me, for me to find out L star uniquely. But you know, if any of you have seen list decoding of codes, and the, nice, the natural question to ask in this setting is not to you know, find L star, but to find a small list that contains an element close to L star. Okay? And so in particular, the tightest possible size of the list that I can ask for from the previous example is 1 over alpha. Let's say I allow you a constant factor slack. What's the constant factor between friends? So you know, let's say I ask you to give me a list of O of 1 over alpha size that contains something close to L star. Okay? That's the problem. That's what I'm going to call the list decodable regression problem. Okay? Good. Any questions about the problem? Oh, the list is, you know, uh, uh, a collection of O of 1 alpha guesses for L star. So it's, it contains like vectors in d-dimensional space. But points in on RD. Points in RD. And one of them has to be close to L star. Okay. So actually, you know, given that that question is asked, let me point it out. It's kind of trivial to generate a list of like 2 to the d size. You know, like discretize, uh, you, know, the, you, you know, let's say you knew the norm of L star, discretize the sphere, and just, you know, you know, send all the epsilon net over. That's always true. I'm looking for a list of size which is an absolute constant that does not depend on the dimension at all. Okay, and that's, as in the co case of list decoding codes, this is kind of the non-trivial and interesting setting. Good. Right. Yes. I should be thinking of the case where if you told me what the inliers are, the problem is again easy because yes. alpha is large enough. That yes, exactly. Yes, so n will always be, you know, uh, large enough uh, for you, like large enough polynomial in the dimension. Alpha is always going to be a constant. So alpha n will always be large enough to you know, uniquely determine L star with high probability, et cetera. Good. So let me tell you the result. Okay? Uh, but before that, let me tell you that uh, uh, it was independently and concurrently discovered also by Prasad Raghavendra and Maurice Yao. They had a slightly larger list size, but you know, that's not split hairs. Basically, they proved you know, almost the same result. And the result says the following. Fix some fixed constant alpha, like 0.25, and fix the inlier distribution to be standard Gaussian. Okay? Then there is an algorithm that takes d to the O of poly 1 over alpha time and samples. Okay? <coughs> if alpha is a constant, this number is a fixed polynomial in D, and outputs a list of size O of 1 over alpha, which is what we would have wanted. And the list contains an element L hat which is, you know, close, relatively speaking, to L star. And this constant, of course, can be made a parameter, but, you know, let's not carry one additional parameter throughout the talk, so, you know, fix it to be some 0 0.01. Okay? Now, you could be legitimately worried that, well, what kind of a polynomial is this? It's like d to the 1 over alpha to the a, that looks nasty. Well, it is nasty. Uh, but, you know, as you'll see, my algorithm is nastier, so this will be the least of your worries. <laughs> Uh, but you know, like uh, more, more seriously speaking, uh, there are easier problems, like strictly easier problems than this one, for which there is this exponential in one over alpha barrier, and there is a reason to believe that in fact this is inherent. So you know, this might actually be the truth. What can we do? All right. So that's the result that I'm going to prove for you. Yes. So you don't even look at all linear equations. Is that what you're saying? Whoa. Where did you get that from? Oh. N, n is like some fixed polynomial. So, you know, n is also d to the O of 1 over alpha to the 8. Yeah, time and samples. Good? Uh, uh, yes. So, your approximation notion in, L, in relative L2, um, do you need it uh, in, in the case of the no noise in the, in the problem? Or it's actually necessary Good. in this setting? Yeah, so in the outlier setting, I don't know how to not have this relative notion. If there are no outliers, you're absolutely right. I don't need a relative error. I can get an absolutely small error regardless of the norm of L star. That's what you're pointing out, right? So you mentioned briefly that the Joachim also works when you actually have random noise on top. Yes. And you're saying that even... Only a tiny amount of noise. But even if there's no noise, literally yes. no noise, you still... Even, yeah, even then, I get only this kind of a guarantee. Is it conceivable that one can recover, make sure that L star belongs to that list? Uh... Good. So information theoretically, yes. And in fact, I'll hopefully be able to prove it to you today. But computationally speaking, I don't know, and it's possible that we can't. But, but I don't know.
so what's the dependence on the 0.01? Right, so it also goes into the exponent. So if this is delta, then you know there'll be some poly 1 over delta poly sitting in. Yeah, pretty bad. Good. No, no, it's, it's poly versus x, right? Like it could be also yeah. x minor. Yeah, yeah, it's always could be worse. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, any more questions before I move on? Good. So, uh, actually, you know, this result works more generally. Uh, you don't actually need Gaussian, standard Gaussian distribution to be the distribution of inliers. It works so long as the distribution satisfies a funky condition called as certifiable anti-concentration, okay? Now, anti-concentration may, may be something that you all have heard about. The certifiable is maybe somewhat mysterious. Let's keep it mysterious for now, okay? I'll, I'll get to it towards the end. Maybe one thing you can remember is that standard Gaussian is certifiably anti-concentrated. That's, that's good enough for the talk. Good, and final comment, the algorithm is gonna be based on the sum of squares method. Again, you don't need to know that. And uh, if I do it right, then you will not know that, even at the end of the talk. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> All right, so good. So you know, uh, before I tell you how to prove this result, Let's, uh, you know, let's somehow you know, uh, understand what the context of such a problem is. Uh, you know, one moment we are talking about simple linear equations and then suddenly a you know, uh, majority of them are outliers. How did we get here? And so you know, there is a cool line of work that began uh, in statistics and by you know, really eminent statisticians like John Tukey and Peter Huber. Tukey is the same Tukey of the fast Fourier transform. And so you know, in the 70s, I were worried about the following question. So, you know, in any statistical problem, you lay a model to understand some phenomenon, and then you do some estimation, some statistical estimation based on your model. Now, you know, if you get lucky, then maybe the real world problem that you're applying your model to would be reasonably close to the model you chose. But it's kind of uh, atrocious to believe that the model would be precisely the same as the real world setting you're looking at. So in general, you can imagine that there'll be some kind of a gap between what the true distribution in reality is and what the model you chose is. And so if your estimator uses too strongly the assumption of your model, then it's kind of not a very good one. And so, you know, Tukey and Huber asked, can you build estimators which, you know, are tolerant to some slight model misspecification? In our context, that translates into saying that if I give you samples from a distribution with like, you know, 10% or so, let's say, are outliers, a small fraction of outliers, small fixed constant fraction of the samples are outliers, can you still somehow run your estimator and you know, give good performance guarantees? So that was a subject of robust statistics and it's a, it's a very well studied area um, and ton of books on it. And you know, some of the punchlines might actually be known to you. For example, if you want to compute mean of a one day distribution and you want to be you know, robust to outliers, then you should use the median. And in some reasonably good settings, median would actually turn out to be a good robust estimator. And it's one of, you know, this kind of a starting point of insights in this work on robust statistics. The cool thing is that they kind of figured out really good estimators that work essentially in all dimensions, except that computing them requires time exponential in the dimension. Okay, so if you are in dimension 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, maybe you're okay. But, you know, we are all grown-ups now, we work in high dimensions. And so then, you know, maybe you are looking for polynomial time algorithms in D. Okay, and so, so the whole question was, can you somehow take this literature on robust statistics and give you know, polynomial time algorithms for you know, the kind of estimation problems that the statisticians were looking at? And that's the area of robust statistics. So this efficient, uh, robust estimators question kind of got like a new, uh, uh, you know, new energy with this 2016 papers by Lyra of Impala and Daiko Nicolas, Kane, Kamath Lee, Moitra, and Stewart. And so they kind of asked this question independently on how to you know, do some basic mean and covariance estimation for Gaussians under some robustness assumptions. And these three dots actually don't do justice to what has happened since then because there are like a ton of papers and that's the reason I you know, decided not to cite any of them. <laughs> Instead, just to say that you know, there is a whole lot of things which are known in just the three and a half years or so that these papers have been out. And you know, many, many papers later, we kind of have a general framework to understand you know, how to do robust estimation whenever the fraction of outliers is some tiny constant. And you know, the tiny that you should remember is like 1%, 5%, maybe not more than 10%, okay? Good. So the story continues, many, many papers and one year later. 
In 2017, <coughs> Cherikar, Steinhardt, and Valiant formally considered the case when alpha could actually be smaller than half, where you know majority of the samples could be outliers. And you know, just like us, they arrived at the conclusion that maybe the right question to ask in this setting is you know, how to do list decodable estimation. And they had some nice practical motivation for it. They thought of it as a model for untrusted data. But let me not go into it. Uh, the motivations, you know, what's motivation between a theory lunch audience. So let's not worry too much about that. But basically, the point is that this 2017 paper sets the context for this list decodable robust estimation setting. That's where we are, you know, that's the game we are playing today. Good. So let me, you know, tell you a little bit about why you might want to care about list decodable regression in particular. Okay. And that's like the last fluffy slide in my talk. So <clears throat> I told you that for the small outlier regime, there is kind of a nice general framework now, and we kind of know, you know, good ideas for you know building estimators which are resilient to let's say 10% noise, 10% outliers. But um, you know, generically speaking, you could expect to do this unique decodability or like learn the parameters under noise as long as alpha is bigger than a half, where as long as you know a, a, a solid majority of the samples are in liars. And there is a gap between like 0.5 and 0.9 or whatever, 0.85, wherever these techniques actually break. Okay, and in sense they break at some un unspecified constant because there are all these constants floating around in these works. And so it turns out, so there are all these you know, previous works, these are all on regression, and you know, they work under various assumptions, but the punchline of these works is that you know, if alpha is bigger than 0.9, if you have like 90% you know, inliers, then you succeed, and you succeed in quite, quite a general situation. You know, like you don't need standard Gaussians, you can, work even on uniform distribution on the hypercube for that matter. Um, but they break down when alpha is let's say 0.8. Okay? Uh, but you can actually use list decodable regression to actually you know, get unique recovery for any alpha strictly bigger than 0.5. And the idea is kind of obvious. You, know? you first run the algorithm for list decodable regression, you get like a small constant size list, take a fresh sample, test, and you can prove that the testing goes right, and that's it. Okay? So in some sense, you know, even though you're dealing with this list recordable recovery setting, it kind of allows you to do unique recovery all the way to the threshold where it actually becomes impossible. That's kind of a nice thing to do. Um, the second piece of motivation that might you know, interest you in doing list decodable regression is this much better studied problem of mixed linear regression. And so you know what is this problem? So you know you know regression, and you know I'm ignoring noise today. So regression just means that I'm giving you linear equations which have a single solution. Mixed linear regression means that there are k possible linear functions, and the right hand side of the equation you are given are computed by one of these k possible things. Okay, and you want to recover, you want to look at the data and recover all k of them. That's what mixed linear regression is. And so you know if you choose k as one over alpha and call one of like one of the clusters as inliers and declare the rest of them as outliers, then you see that it kind of maps into a setting. It's like a special case. So whenever you get an algorithm for least decodable regression, you get one for mixed linear regression too. And actually it turns out that the best result that we know for mixed linear regression now is actually using the least decodable regression algorithm I'm going to tell you about. The reason is that <coughs> all prior results for this problem need assumptions on Ls. They need that you know, Li's are sufficiently separated. Uh, by the way, this is also the problem which is an easier case and requires exponential dependence on 1 over alpha, the one that I referred to earlier. And so, uh, uh, but, but if you use list decodable regression algorithm as a subroutine, then you don't need any separation assumption, so you get kind of an assumption-free version uh, of an algorithm for mixed linear regression. Yes? Just to make sure I understand, bi is equal to xi identified with li, li is overloaded there, right? Shouldn't that be like... Yeah, like absolutely. Like yeah, there should be j, and j varies from 1 through k, and that should be for all j. Good, yeah. You can see that I made the slides last night. <laughs> Good. So, for, for me, so, so when we pick the x's, if we assume the solution was 0, the l was 0, then it seems to make a lot of sense to pick from a distribution, but I'm a little confused. When you pick the xi to be Gaussian, normal uh -huh. Gaussian or something, uh -huh. right? It seems natural then to assume that l was 0, right? You know, the, the, the solution is the all zero vector. Why would, why would you say well, that? Because then you're just drawing lines through the origin, right? And you, the you're saying like origin, uh, maybe you're just eliminating I, directions, right? Maybe like concatenate one more bit. Is that what you're suggesting? Like, oh, no, I see. Maybe there's some way to think of it that way. Yeah, yeah, there is a way to, yes. 
Yes, there is a way to think of it uh, as just discovering zero directions. So this problem happens to be the same as uh, learning covariances, which have like one dimensional kernels. But and that's like kind of the thing they're suggesting, I think. But OK, let's, let's not get into that. I'll maybe come to that at the end when I tell you how this problem generalizes. Good, but. Uh, but you're saying that maybe one assumption is to assume that we're looking for the all zero vector here at this point, and then you're saying there's a way to get to that. Yes. Standard it's actually equivalent. Uh, if I understood you correctly, then it's actually equivalent. Okay. Good. So, and the third motivation, which is like the most important one for this talk, is that I think it's a cool problem. And so, you know, let's ignore the other two, okay? It's like, it's a fun problem. It's linear equations. Uh, how can they not be fun? So let's think about that anyway. Yes? Uh, how specific is this to, like, the most decodable thing to mixtures? How specific is it to regressions? Like, can you do a similar thing for mixtures of Gaussians? Like, or something Good, like yes. That? Yes, you can. Uh, and hopefully I'll get to it <laughs> at the end. But, you know, yes, yeah, so this, this algorithm kind of is kind of a general framework for doing list decodable estimation. And so there's some history of this problems in the context of mean estimation, which is the only problem which was studied before. If you don't know what that is, ignore it. But it captures mixtures of Gaussians, if you know that, what that problem is. And you, know, you can recover those results using the stuff I'm going to tell you. But, but OK, you can ignore this last uh, four sentences. Good. So let's, uh, that, that completes the fluff part of my talk. Let me tell you how actually I'm going to prove this theorem that I claim to you. And the outline of my talk is the same as outline of, I don't know, when I, when I, I don't remember the last time I gave a talk which didn't have this outline. <laughs> so the outline is the same, which is that, you know, it turns out that there is kind of a general method to design algorithms using sum of squares. And it kind of always involves focusing on the information theoretic question of showing that a small sample has unique information to learn whatever, you know, you're trying to learn. So here we are trying to recover a list, which is like good in the sense that it contains something close to L star. So you know, let's, we'll forget about algorithms completely. We'll just solve the information theoretic problem. It turns out that if you solve it in like not so complicated a way, then you can SOS size your proof, by which it means that you can kind of look at it and like do some mechanical transformations. And you know, just uh, magically uh, algorithm comes out, which is efficient. That's the second step. And the third step, you know, basically happens after 1 PM. <laughs> Good. So that's the outline of my talk. Let's move on and tell you how to do the first step. But the thing to remember is, you know, most of my talk is going to be about, you know, designing a highly inefficient algorithm. Okay. And so when I when I suggest that you, you know, take interest in this and like, you know, play the game with me here, remember that it's going to yield the algorithm. Uh, so it's it's not like uh, just some fun game that we are playing. It's actually going to yield the algorithm. So you know. Uh, bear with me and you know uh, keep following this discussion on the identifiability question. Okay. So here is my punchline for you. Let's design algorithms like complexity theorists. I better not say that to donors, <laughs> but uh, but you know this is theory lunch. Let me say it anyway. So <laughs> I don't think they'll get here. <laughs> So, you know, when I, when, you know, when I tell a complexity audience that I want to design a polynomial time algorithm for a problem, the first question they should ask me is, well, you know, can you first tell me how you can verify solutions to it? It's like, you know, is it in NP or something? Is that easy to do? Let's worry about that question. Let's worry about the question that if I gave you a list, I gave you a bunch of k-linear functions, how can you verify that, you know, one of them is good? How can you verify that I gave you a good list? Okay? Now this is, uh, yeah, we are all uh, at least uh, partially complexity audience. So you know, this is the question of you know how to recognize a purported solution. How can we certify that something that I have in my hands is actually good? Okay. Good. So that's the question we are going to be focusing on. Now that looks uh, a little bit different from this information theoretic identifiability I was speaking about. But let me mention that it's actually equivalent. Okay. If you can use a small sample and build you know, a certificate for you know, certifying good lists in the sense that your certificate and your verifier have the property that whenever the list is good, the certificate exists that makes the verifier accept. Whenever the list is bad, there is no certificate that will cause the verifier to accept. If this is the property that you actually ensure, then I claim that you can actually prove as an immediate corollary that the size of the sample that you had is enough for you know, capturing all the information about L star or recovering the list. And why is that? Well, you know, I'll just look at that sample. And you know, I'll go over all possible infinitely many <clears throat> you know, k-tuples of lists, search for all possible certificates over them, 
and you know, see if there is some certificate that causes my verifier to accept. That's it. You know, I know that one of them will actually work, and I know that if uh, you know a bad list cannot actually be accepted because of the completeness and soundness properties of my you know certificate verifier. Good. So you know, it gives me identifiability. It establishes that a small sample has enough information to recover whatever I want. Okay. So I'm going to focus on this question. I'm going to focus on how we can verify if I gave you a list, if it's actually a good list. So it's not correct. There could be many solutions, right? Because so few of the yes. things are correct. Yes. There may be an exponential number of yes. solutions. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And all you want, and, and any one of them is okay? Or yeah, any one of them is okay. Originally no, no, any one of them is okay. Any, give me any list that contains an L star and I'll be happy. No, no, but of the original problems, we took, we, we, we had some L in mind. And then we found some, we wrote down some equations which were correct and some yes. that were, were fictitious. Mm -hmm. But any subset of those mm -hmm. equations now of the larger set that have a solution you're happy with? No, no. I want to find a list that contains L star. I want to I wanna do something that is meaningful to the original inliers, even though I may not know who they are. I want to find a list that contains the original L star. Even though the, the other solutions someone else would have made up the game for which they were after the other solution. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, is there some way to distinguish between my, suppose we both ended up with the same set of equations, but I had a different set that's, of equations? That's kind of, you know, in other words, a question about identifiability. It's a question of whether the L star is statistically identifiable from data. That's what we're going to worry about. We're going to, you know, we are going to make assumptions on the inlier distribution, which makes it possible for us to uniquely recover a list that contains L star. You want to say it can't happen? Yes. If there are, if the distribution of the inliers is nice enough, okay. then it cannot happen. But the, but the important thing is that the assumption will only be about inliers. The adversary's game will not be controlled. Right. Okay. Good. It's an important point that Gary pointed out. You know, you could say, you know, I'll, I'll find you some alpha and size subset, and I'll find you a linear function that, you know, solves those equations. Well, I'm not happy with that. I want you to find a list that contains the original L star. And the L star is, you know, whatever solved the original inliers. That's, that's, that's the only thing that will make me happy here. Good. So that's the question we are after. How can we check <coughs> if, uh, how can we check if a given list is actually good? So let's try to, you know, kind of implement Gary's idea, okay? Let's try to see if it actually can help us or when it can help us. The idea was that, you know, if anyone gives me a list of L1 through LK, they are an all-powerful prover. In addition, I'll ask them to give me some subsets of alpha n points, alpha n subset, alpha n size subsets, such so that each LI you know, solves one of these subsets. Okay, so like, give me a certificate of alpha n size uh, uh, equations that each of L1, L2, LK solve. Okay? That's a reasonable thing to ask. You know, if LIs are good, then there must be such equations. Why don't you just plug it in yourself? I could do that myself, yes. You'll see where I'm going with this in a second. You're right, like, you know, the verifier could find out these equations by themselves. But, you know, the prover is ready to do his job for us, so we'll ask them to do it anyway. Okay? Good. So now what can we do? The only thing we can somehow say is that, you know, clearly if I ask for only one L, then there might be a completely bogus alpha n set which has nothing to do with L star. But maybe you could hope that if K is large enough, then this won't happen. Maybe if I choose k to be large enough polynomial in 1 over alpha, maybe this actually does not happen. Maybe like any list will actually contain something close to L star. Okay? Does it make sense, like the, the potential claim I'm making? Okay, good. So, uh, well, it shouldn't have made sense because it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and and here, is a, uh, here is a simple reason why, okay? I'm going to give you an adversary strategy that will, amount to, uh, cons uh, that will amount to saying that the exponentially many uh, vectors L for which you can find alpha and size subsets, okay, if the adversary chooses their outliers, you know, in some specific way, okay. And it's actually kind of very simple, okay. The outliers, the outlier adversary, the, the outlier generating adversary's game is very simple. Their distribution generates coefficient vectors which are only the standard basis vectors, even E2, E sub D, okay? So the, the, their Xi's in particular are only going to be one of these D things. And remember, EI is the vector which is like one in the ith place and zero otherwise, okay? And now their strategy is the following. They have this control of one minus alpha fraction of the uh, uh, samples. 
they're going to populate them with equal number of you know uh, 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 equations with ei as the coefficient vector and amongst eis they will populate them equally with plus 1 and minus 1 as labels okay does it make sense like does it does it make sense what the outlier strategy is good and once i do that you know i can basically choose uh, you know if I choose E1, it's like you know deciding what uh, uh, the first coordinate of the unknown you know solution should be, and I can choose any solution for E2. I can choose any solution for E3. So you can see that without even looking at the inliers, I can generate all possible plus minus one to the d vectors as solutions here. Okay, and so there are exponentially many of them. So you know this strategy doesn't work. Okay, good. So that doesn't work. But you say, wait, you know, this kind of looks really fishy. The way I constructed this example and the way, you know, I broke this idea of a certificate was simply that, you know, I, I'm going to ignore the inliers completely and, you know, play my game only in the outliers. That seems like a shady strategy. I should not be allowed to do that, right? If you give me a list, L1, L2, up to L sub k, each of them comes with a soluble subset in the sense that it comes with a set of size alpha n equations for which you know li is a solution now i should really ask that this this soluble subsets do not somehow favor any particular sample too much they should somehow have some coverage property they should really look at you know each sample as much as they can so that i can somehow guarantee that they haven't ignored the inliers if you change your co if you change your uh, coordinates so that basically your uh, equation L star is the standard basis equation to say just now the out uh, adversary adds all those uh, others then you cannot find so you cannot find it good yes that's what I'm getting at just a little bit slower <laughs> okay. yeah yeah you're right absolutely so but but you know let's let's do this one step before because it's going to help us. So, it seemed like in the, in the, in the previous, uh, you know, kind of a simple example that I built, we failed because the soluble subsets that we created were all in the 1 minus alpha fraction of the samples. So, if I could somehow ask them to be spread out in the sense that, you know, cover as many samples as possible, not favor any single sample too much, if I could somehow impose this constraint, then maybe they would have to play with the inliers a little bit, and then maybe things would be all right. That seems like some reasonable, you know, heuristic. So, you know, let's modify our notion of a certificate to what I would like to call as a soluble partition. Okay? What does that mean? I would like you, or I would like the prover to take the n samples, divide them into chunks of alpha n samples each. So, alpha n equations in each bin, one over alpha of the bins. Okay? And it's a complete partition. Okay? Each of these sets should be soluble in the sense that, you know, each of uh, the pieces of the partition should be satisfied by a single vector, let's say L1, L2, L sub k, okay? And that's what I would take as a certificate. Now, obviously the worry is that such a, such a soluble partition may not even exist in the sample. Well, let's worry about that later. Let's imagine that we get lucky and such a soluble partition actually happens to exist. If it does happen to exist, then it's a reasonable thing to consider the certificate. So let's play with it for a bit. Okay. So you know, a soluble partition does have the property that we were looking for. It has to play with the inliers. So you know, here's a simple argument that says that if I give you a soluble partition with each a piece of alpha n size or larger, then one of the pieces must intersect the inliers in alpha fraction of the points in the inliers. And that's just like a pigeonhole principle or whatever argument. Right. It's so very simple. So now we are saying that one of the pieces must intersect the inliers in large number of places. We want to somehow say that you know this piece, any vector that satisfies this piece must actually also kind of satisfy you know the inliers. That will be our hope anyway. If that doesn't happen, then of course uh, we are in trouble. But let's you know ask for that. And so what Boris already saw five minutes ago is that this doesn't work at least if I'm allowed arbitrary distributions d as the distributions of my inliers. Because I can just choose the inlier distribution also, uh, you know, the same as the outlier distribution in my previous example. You know, just choose the inliers to also have the coefficient vectors coming just from the standard basis vectors. 
Okay? And now you choose some L star which is in plus minus 1 to the D. And now, you know, I can do the same kind of trick that I was doing earlier, only on the outliers. Now I can do it even with the inliers. And you can, in fact, check that I can build partitions of this sample by just choosing, you know, correct values of E1, E2, and so on. Okay? So I can build, so you know, essentially you can show that I can build any or at least exponentially many possible subsets of one over alpha vectors, you know, which satisfy uh, a soluble partitions in this data. Does it make sense, like at least intuitively? Good, so, okay, that seems problematic. You know, this, this, uh, this great idea of ours also failed. So let's, you know, go back and ask why did we fail because that's gonna tell us what to ask about the distribution D. Okay, so you know we were kind of hopeful that this is a property that will help us. If P1 through PK is the soluble partition into like K groups of alpha and size each, then we said you know one of the pieces must intersect the inliers in alpha fraction of the points. And we were hoping that this would help us. So let's say P1 is the piece, okay? But somehow we failed. What does this mean that P1 you know is a soluble piece, meaning that there is some vector that satisfies it, let's say L, okay? And the inliers are obviously also a soluble piece and L star satisfies them. Moreover, we are saying that P1 intersect I is satisfied by both L and L star, right? That must mean that if I look at the difference of the vectors L minus L star, if L not equal to L star, this is a non-zero vector, then X dot V must equal zero for all x that lie in the intersection of this piece P1 and the inliers, okay? Now, you know, I'm actually, so what we have proven is that, you know, there is, there is a direction V which is non-zero such that alpha fraction of the inliers are orthogonal to this direction, okay? If the sample is large enough, then you can actually conclude from here that the same property holds for the distribution of inliers. We kind of verified it for the inliers that we see, but if it's large enough, you can imagine some standard convergence arguments will go through. And you can actually conclude that when you choose x iid from the distribution d, then x dot v is zero for at least alpha fraction of the points. Okay? All, all very simple things, but I hope, you know, so far the discussion is clear. So that's why we failed. Okay, we, we, we kind of pinned down the reason why we failed. So let's disallow that. <laughs> no, we failed because of it, so let's stop that from happening. So you know, here's a cool definition. I'm gonna call a distribution on R to the small d beta anti-concentrated if uh, there is no direction V such that uh, a beta fraction of the distribution is orthogonal to V. So there is no direction V so that x dot V is zero uh, with probability, you know, uh, uh, at least beta. This makes sense? It's kind of motivated from just, you know, correcting our failure. So I didn't mention this, but our failure there was actually inherent. It was not just a problem with the certificate, but it was just, you know, as Boris pointed out, an issue that we really can't solve that problem information theoretically in the setting that we saw before. And so this definition and this condition is now going to allow to make the problem actually soluble, okay? So a little bit about anti-concentration, or at least some versions of it that you might have seen before. It's a very well studied idea in probability analysis, combinatorics. Um, it has like, you know, we're going back to 100 plus years. Um, but let me tell you some cool facts. Standard Gaussian distribution, in my definition, is zero anti-concentrated. This should not be hard, it's a continuous measure. That's, that's how they do, that's how they roll. Uniform distribution, the discrete distribution in the case is more interesting. But let me state the, the, the bad news about such discrete distributions. The uniform distribution on zero one to the D is not half anti-concentrated, meaning there are simple directions, just the coordinate directions, which cause the distribution's projection in that direction to be zero at least half the time. Good, and you can extend these to, you know, bigger discrete domains and, you know, get, you know, not anti-concentrated distributions for various values of, you know, one over Q. Good, so now we have pointed out some difference between standard Gaussian and these discrete distributions. Let's remember that. And now state, uh, you know, um, now, you know, kind of, you know, formalize this idea that we've been playing with already, that, you know, list decodable regression to even be possible requires that a distribution of inliers be sufficiently anti-concentrated, okay? 
So in particular, one corollary of that uh, formalization is that if you want to do list decodable regression on the uniform distribution on the Boolean hypercube, and you have less than or equal to half fraction of inliers, well, then you are in trouble. You cannot do it. Okay? In fact, you can prove here, but I won't because it's simple and it won't add too much, that any list uh, that you will construct here would have to be size at least the dimension of the hypercube. So there is no fixed constant size list you can produce provably. And you know, this uh, kind of extends to the discrete distribution that I talked about earlier. Um, but it's important to note here, you know, a difference between large alpha and alpha smaller than or equal to half, okay? I kind of mentioned it before that when alpha sufficiently exceeds half, then there are already works that show that you can actually solve this recordable regression on uniform distribution of the hypercube. On the other hand, I'm claiming that in alpha is at most half, you cannot do it provably, information theoretically. Okay, so there is kind of a difference between this list decodable setting and the small outlier setting. Good, so that's the you know, variant of the result for more discrete distributions. And here is like the most interesting uh, 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 positive result, which is that basically that's the only barrier, at least information theoretically speaking, to the possibility of list decodable regression, okay? In other words, if the inliers are drawn from a distribution which is delta anti-concentrated, okay, and delta is strictly smaller than the fraction of inliers, then we can, inefficiently so, output a good list of size which is like about one over alpha minus delta. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is, you know, just give you a proof of this result. It's all very simple, but I'm going to give you a proof of this result, and then we'll talk about how it becomes algorithmic. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. Good. So, you know, let's go back to this case that we were considering before. Let's say we got lucky and there is a way to partition the sample that we saw into pieces of size alpha n, and each of this alpha n piece itself is soluble. Okay? Suppose the prover can manage to produce such a certificate for me. Okay? Let's at least make sure that this is good now with the distribution, like with the assumption on the inlier distribution. Okay, last time it failed because we didn't have anti-concentration, maybe this time we'll actually succeed. And we will. <coughs> so, so here is the claim. The claim just says that if D is delta less than alpha anti-concentrated, and let's say that you give me a list L1, L2, L sub K, where K is one over alpha, and let's say it's a, it's a list which is certified by a soluble partition, then one of the list elements must actually equal L star. Okay, any such list contains L star. Okay? And the proof is kind of, you know, just go back to what we did and like invert it. So let me do it. So, you know, the same reasoning holds. There must be a piece in the partition which intersects the inliers in alpha fraction of the places. Right? Look at, you know, what happens uh, to the linear function that labels pi correctly and look at the linear function that labels i correctly. Alpha squared. Good, yes. It's alpha fraction of the inlier, so it should be alpha square n. Good. So, so, but you know, going back to our argument, it's kind of the same argument we did before. We know that L minus, Li minus L star must, you know, uh, if I project x in the direction Li minus L star, it must evaluate to zero on alpha fraction of the inliers. If you extend that to distribution, large enough sample, blah, blah, blah then you get that you know, the, on the distribution it must hold that in the direction L minus L star, X projects out to zero with probability let's say about alpha, and if it is strictly bigger than delta, you have a contradiction unless L minus L star equals zero. That's it. Okay, so it's, it's basically going back to argument and fixing it. Good? So, just to make sure, so the, are the, all the alpha is now alpha squared? So that's an alpha squared, the first one, but the second one is an alpha. That. Yes, let's do that, yes. So, the first claim just says that, you know, pi must intersect the inliers in alpha fraction of the size of the inliers. So, it should be alpha times i. Okay? Then we are saying, what does it mean? It means that if I take x in, you know, this intersection, and I project it in li minus l star direction, then it becomes zero, you know, for alpha fraction of the points. Go to the distribution, it means that, you know, up to some convergence business, 
alpha with some about alpha probability x projects out to zero in L minus L star direction, and that violates anti-concentration. Uh, you know, if L minus L star is not zero. So it's basically alpha times the size of i. Yes. Size yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what it should be over there. Yes, yes, yeah, you, yeah. Let's say we did all of that. Good. So let's go back to this issue that we already discussed. This is all, you know, fine and dandy. You know, whenever soluble partitions exist, we are all happy, but they may not exist. So what do we do? We have to build a different certificate. Uh, so let's do that. Okay. We made some progress, so let's not uh, give up on that and let's try to generalize soluble partitions. Okay. So let's try to understand a slightly more general way to look at soluble partitions. This could be a little bit confusing, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, you'll see why in a second. So remember why we did this partition business. We wanted to somehow have this idea of coverage, right? We wanted some, some way to you know, have a set of soluble subsets that cover as many of the samples as possible. And remember that you know, we, this is the kind of only angle we have because we don't quite know the inliers. But we still have to somehow guarantee that one of the pieces of the partition intersects the inliers, you know, substantially. So we, we can somehow only ask for like, you know, sufficient coverage or something. So let's try to, you know, formalize this notion, okay? So instead of looking at the partition, I'm going to think about the distribution which basically outputs a subset of alpha and points from the samples, okay? And given a partition, I just think of the uniform distribution on pieces of this partition. Okay, this, this is a notational change. Okay, nothing, nothing great is happening so far. Good. So now, here is a trivial observation. If I have a partition, P1 through PK, each piece is exactly alpha in size, then the probability that a randomly drawn piece from the distribution mu contains some fixed sample X sub J is exactly equal to you know, 1 over K or alpha. That's because you know exactly one piece in the partition contains it, and the probability of drawing that piece is like one over k. Good. So you know let's define this quantity as you know some w j of mu. It's some you know some frequency statistic of how many times x j is being used, you know, in the pieces of my partition. Okay. And the other thing I want you to remember is that by linearity, if I add you know w j of mu then I get alpha n. That's because you know, every piece in my partition was alpha n sized. So that's just linearity. Good? All right. So now let's try to generalize this to arbitrary distributions on soluble sets. Okay? A partition was a collection of soluble sets that happened to be disjoint. But now let's look at you know, a collection of soluble sets, a distribution on them. Okay? and extend this notion that we defined in the previous slide to such distributions. So I'm going to define wj mu as the same frequency statistic. How many times does j appear when I pick a piece randomly from the distribution mu? Okay? And the same thing holds because this was just about linearity. The sum of wj mu is going to be alpha and regardless of whether you are a partition or not. Okay? And so now I want to define you know, a notion of coverage. What does coverage mean? So before I write down, let's just maybe intuitively understand what we want. In a soluble partition, all the wj mu's were like basically equal. So this vector of wj mu's as j varies was like completely uniformly spread out. Okay? That's kind of the greatest thing for me. It covers every sample equally. I would like to aspire to that ideal. Okay? So I'm going to define this measure of how spread out I am via the sum of the squares of wj's. Okay? So, you know, if you've seen L1, L2 sparsity, then this is like, you know, that's what I'm using here. I'm, you know, doing some analytical relaxation of sparsity. Good. So let's remind ourselves. This is some measure of spread outness of the distribution mu. And in particular, it is minimized exactly when the mu is a uniform distribution over a soluble partition. That's the, that's the point where wj mu's all become, you know, equal. And that's the minimum value. All of this is believable, right? Good. So now we have a more general notion of a certificate. We don't ask for a soluble partition. We ask for a distribution on soluble subsets. Okay. Each of them must be satisfied by some linear function L sub i. Okay. 
So one and two are kind of obvious. The third is the non-trivial thing, which kind of you know is trying to replace this partition constraint, which is that I'm going to look for you know a mu that you know minimizes w of mu. Okay. So it's like you know find me a mu which is as spread out as possible. Maybe a partition doesn't exist, but you know just do your best. Good. And kind of the point is that everything that we did works even for this you know more general notion of the certificate. Basically the same argument that we did can be repeated, okay? The key point is that for a mu that minimizes w, the w of mu measure, you can still show that, you know, it's gonna, like w of mu intersects the inliers in the sense that it has large enough weight on the inliers precisely in the same way that a partition did, okay? And this is, this is just, you know, some simple variational argument. You know, if it has less, less thing, if mu places less weight on the inliers, you can always mix it with some more, you can, like, you know, inliers are always a soluble set, so you can always, you know, mix it with, you know, the distribution which is, which outputs the inliers with probability one, and you can, like, shift the weights, and you can always make this happen. So okay? you mean overall uh, soluble subsets for the same Li, or for possibly different? No, no, all possible, like. Oh, over all possible. All possible, yes. Okay. So the distribution is, like, Pi comma Li, and Li solves okay. Pi. Okay. Okay, does it make sense? No, yeah, this is all, yeah, it's all very robust. Yeah, I don't exactly need the minimum. But, you know, we are not, we don't care about the time right now. If I claim that this is a minimum, you know, you can in infinite time check that it is a minimum. <laughs> and so, you know, I would ask you to do that. <laughs> Good. So, so this you agree, or at least, you know, see that this could be true, it's plausible. Good. That's what I'm going for. So now I want to say that, you know, such a mu is actually enough to generate the list. Okay? And here is a trivial algorithm to do that. I take this mu and I sample, you know, about 1 over alpha minus delta uniform, uh, uniformly from this distribution. I generate these pieces. Now they are no more a partition. You know, they are just, they could intersect. But I've controlled the amount of intersection they can have. Okay? And I'm just going to output the list of vectors that solve them. Okay? And it's kind of not very hard to show that now one of the allies that solves them would be, you know, L star exactly equal to L star, with high probability, blah, 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 okay? And the argument is kind of very simple, like there's only one kind of key step, which is also easy, which is that, you know, you can do some averaging to show that if I take that many samples, then there must be one PI which intersects the inliers in something which is bigger than delta fraction of it, which is all I need to violate anti-concentration. So it's the same argument, except now we did with this more general notion of the certificate. Good? I'm going for plausibility here, not like trying to convince you with like 100% probability anymore. <laughs> Good. So we are done. Okay, we, we, we did this certification problem. Looks like, a, you know, why are we doing this? What, what do we care? <laughs> but you know, let's say you cared about it. It was fun, right? Like solving linear equations, certifying them. How can it be boring? Good. What about the algorithm? So again, you know, let's go back and uh, ask 455 students what they would do. So, okay, you know, you gave me an NP verifier or whatever, something that looks like a verifier, it's not NP, but you know, it's a verifier nonetheless. And it accepts some certificates. So how would you convert it into an algorithm? Well, you know, just search for the certificate. So instead of ask for a certificate to approve, let's find a certificate. Find a distribution which satisfies all those properties. Seems reasonable. That's what you would do if you are in 455. And the rounding would be the same. Once you found this mu, you would do exactly the same as we did before, and that would be an algorithm, right? But if you are a 455 student, you'd also say that, well, didn't you suggest p is not equal to np or something, and this is not supposed to be possible, like, what's going on? So, you know, let's, uh, let's answer that question. So yeah, finding a distribution that satisfies a bunch of nice properties is hard, is np hard, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, let's replace distribution by an object called as a pseudo distribution. Okay? There is only one or maybe two properties of pseudo distribution that you need to know. And this is all going to be vague, okay? I apologize for it, but pseudo distributions, unlike distributions, can actually be found in polynomial time. What does that mean? If I only cared about finding low degree moments of pseudo distributions that follow a bunch of constraints, 
then I can find them in polynomial time. I can find degree t moments in d to the o of t time. Okay? Remember that degree t moments require d to the o of t numbers to describe this kind of the best you can do anyway. Okay? And the algorithm that does this is called the sum of squares algorithm. That's the only thing I'm going to tell you about it, unfortunately. But, or maybe one more thing. The one more thing is, this would be useless unless pseudo distributions do behave like distributions, you know, at least to an extent. That's the whole uh, thing that we're trying to do here. And so they do, that's the point. Pseudo distributions behave like distributions as long as you reason about properties which are known to sum of squares. Again, it's a mysterious comment, not understandable, but you know, I'm going for the vague here. Good. But you know, let's imagine for a second that pseudo distributions were exactly distributions, okay? Even then I've posed kind of a non-trivial restriction on you because you now have to work with only degree up to t moments, right? Let's say I forgot about, you know, pseudo distributions. I just give you degree up to t moments of the distribution. That, you know, satisfies the constraints that we wanted to. This is still a new question. We kind of did not answer it. And the part that breaks is that we can't kind of, uh, you know, repeat this sampling step because how do we sample if I only know low degree moments of a distribution? So we are going to simulate it somehow. And there is some rounding that you need to do. And it's, you know, some interesting new rounding that I'm not going to tell you about. But you can do it. So you can replace, you know, this generate list step by something else that kind of plays with the degree t, low degree moments. And it works for distributions. And then it also works for pseudo distributions. That's all I'm going to say about that. Yes? So just to be clear, uh, this is it's not a distribution. This is a distribution you're constructing over these verifier inputs. So this, at the, in the end of the day, this will not require you to know the moments of the actual distribution that you're getting your inputs, right? Uh, good. There are two distributions. So let's make sure that we understand what we're talking about. No, I'm, I'm not talking about pseudo. I'm, I'm talking about like this. This at no point is going to require you to actually know. Uh, what the inlier distribution yeah. is? No. Only the at no point do I need, I just need that the inlier distribution is sufficiently anti-concentrated. Yeah. I just don't, I, didn't, I don't need to know anything about it, anything else about it. Okay, so one final uh, issue while we are discussing with issues and solving vaguely, you know, some of squares needs to know about anti-concentration. You know, if you want to like make this argument about pseudo, like distributions extend to pseudo distributions, there has to be some algorithmic version of anti-concentration. But it turns out, and I didn't tell you what, but sum of squares can reason only about polynomials. And the hand wavy way to take care of it is that you, you know, formulate anti-concentration as a condition about polynomials. And you give low degree sum of squares proof of it, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter what it means. You do something. Good. So if the last part was uh, vague, but you know, at least mildly interesting depending on uh, what you saw before that, then you can come to my class in the spring because I'll, I'll, I'll make this uh, uh, very precise and very rigorous. So that's my advertisement. Uh, there's also a monograph that you can read. That's a, that's a self plug. Uh, and that reminds you what we did. We kind of you know, spent like two minutes on step two. Uh, step one is kind of the non-trivial thing, which is kind of, you know, I want to point out that this is kind of intentional in the sense that this has been done so many times now. It has like so many problems have actually been solved this way that the bulk of the work is in really constructing the identifiability proof. Like step one is kind of the most non-trivial step. Like whenever you get step one done, step two is, you know, okay, you sit down, it's like, well, life is hard, let's work it out, you know, make it SOS, whatever. You know, you, you kind of, you know, if you pull in enough resources, then you will do it. So step one is kind of the, you know, where some clever ideas could occur. Step two is kind of, you know, more grunt work with some maybe ideas going here and there. Step three is always nice. Good. So, okay. So I'm gonna take two minutes and uh, you know tell you one concrete open problem. Okay. There are like tons of exciting open questions. So forget some of squares in just robust statistics and the kind of questions we discussed today. There are tons of questions open because it's a three plus years old area at best. So, in the context of the work that I just showed you. Like an immediate question is, which distributions are certifiably anti-concentrated? I just told you one example, standard Gaussians. And you can perturb it a little bit, like uniform distribution in the sphere is also anti-concentrated, but you know, that's kind of the same. Um, and I don't really know many more examples. Okay, so, so basically the Gaussian thing was not really far off from the truth. I can call it whatever name, but I can only do Gaussians essentially right now. 
Um, it turns out that if the anti-concentration fails only for some structured vectors, which is the case for the Boolean hypercube, if you know what I'm talking about, it turns out that only sparse vectors you know, fail anti-concentration. And if you make an assumption that the uh, original L star was not sparse, then actually it can, turns out that you can use the same algorithm and you know, make things work even on the Boolean hypercube. So maybe there is some silver lining over there. But really the question here is like, how do we prove things are certifiably anti-concentrated? It's a new definition and I'm sure it will find many more applications. So it's I think a good thing to investigate in the context of this paper itself. Uh, but here is a more general problem and it goes back to Gary's question at the beginning which is that the regression problem I just told you about is a very special case of this problem of covariance estimation under you know, large fraction of outliers. Okay? So let me tell you quickly what this problem is. So you have an unknown Gaussian distribution. Let's say it has mean zero and it has some covariance sigma star. Okay? Now I give you samples where alpha fraction come IID from this Gaussian. One minus alpha fraction are added adversarially you know, by the evil adversary. What do you want to do? I want to come up with a list of potential covariances, not too large, such that one of them is close to sigma star. Okay, and you can define natural notions of closeness. Uh, let me not actually worry too much about that right now because I'm stating it only vaguely. So it turns out that if you use appropriate notions of closeness, like you know approximation in loaner ordering, then it corresponds to uh, it, it corresponds to a generalization of the problem of learning mixtures of arbitrary Gaussians. Just like list decodable regression generalizes mixed linear regression, this problem generalizes learning mixtures of arbitrary Gaussians. And if you know, there was a two the force work of Moitra, Valiant, and Kalai from 10 years ago, which kind of did this in the no noise setting. So this is kind of you know, a challenging, noisy counterpart of it. Um, we don't quite know how to do that. Uh, regression that we did is like a very special case. It corresponds to covariances which have all eigenvalues one but one, which is zero. You can generalize this to projection covariances where eigenvalues are either one or zero, but I don't know how many. That's the case that corresponds to robust subspace recovery. And like NH and I have some result that shows that we can kind of do that problem now. But we don't know how to do covariance estimation. It's kind of a cool problem. Uh, and you know, ask me for more, but you know, that's one concrete open problem I want to leave you with. Good, that's it.